Lord Hughes will explain the decision of the court. This appeal raised a highly technical question about confiscation under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. Um, Guraj had pleaded guilty to offences involving the supply of heroin and associated money laundering. He'd been caught in possession at home of about a, a kilogram and a half of heroin, some amphetamine, and some cocaine as well. Hidden in the house and garage was equipment for processing the drugs, such as a hydraulic press and cutting agents. And in addition, various substantial quantities of cash. He appeared to have been supplying drugs for some time, and he was plainly liable to confiscation of the amount of his benefit calculated in accordance with the Act. Sometimes the calculation of benefit, which is closely regulated by the Act, causes a good deal of debate. In this case, it didn't. The amount was in due course agreed. The issue was whether the court had power to make any order at all. It was contended on his behalf, Guraj's behalf, that there was no power because two things had gone wrong with the procedure. Firstly, the Act says that things should be done in a certain order. Sentence can come before confiscation, but various forms of financial order can't come before it. There is a reason for that. A fine, for example, depends on means, ability to pay. And until the confiscation has been dealt with, you may not know what the defendant's means are. But as well as fines, forfeiture orders are among the ones which the Act says ought to come after confiscation. In the present case, there was no question of a fine. The court sent Gouraj to prison and nobody complains about that. The sooner he started his sentence, the better. Whilst doing so, the court also made a forfeiture order. It forfeited the drugs which had been found, a car, a laptop and some mobile phones which he'd used uh, for his offending. There wasn't any dispute about those orders being made uh, and they could not have been different if they had been made later after confiscation. But they were in fact made in the wrong order. They ought to have been made according to the Act uh, after confiscation rather than before. The second problem was that the Act certainly allows confiscation to be postponed until after sentence, and usually it needs to be. But it says that postponements must be for specific periods, and then there's a long stop of two years, uh, unless there's something exceptional about the case, such as, for example, that the defendant ran away. Uh, in the present case, uh, the judge correctly gave directions for the management of a later confiscation hearing, statements to be lodged on both sides and so on. But then the prosecution lost the file for about a year. And moreover, even after they found it, two hearings were aborted because they weren't properly prepared. Uh, the argument uh, that the power to make a confiscation order had as a result been lost was based on another specific provision in the Act. There is a provision which says, firstly, that procedural errors over postponement don't invalidate any confiscation order. But it also says that this saving shall not apply if things have been done in the wrong order, as they were here. So the defendant said that since the saving clause didn't apply, the prosecution mishandling and delays uh, meant that there could be no confiscation order at all. The judge held that that might have been true if any injustice had been done to the defendant, but since it hadn't, it wasn't. The Court of Appeal, however, disagreed. Uh, it held that once the saving clause didn't apply, it followed that the uh, prosecution mishandling uh, was fatal and no order could ever be made. 
this court holds that in this instance, it was the judge who was right and not the Court of Appeal. Uh, the reason is, essentially, that independently of the saving clause, the rule is that a procedural error of this kind does not necessarily make it unlawful to make a confiscation order. Quite apart from the specific provision which is in this Act, the House of Lords held some time ago that if there's a procedural defect such as this, you should look at the consequences and ask whether Parliament must have meant the defect to be fatal. You should also remember that the statute lays on the court a duty to make a confiscation order. Uh, in those circumstances, the House of Lords held uh, some time ago that Parliament did not intend every procedural failure to result in automatic invalidity. Uh, it meant to make the sentencing and confiscation process effective, so that at least if there was no injustice suffered by the defendant, a procedural defect need not be fatal. This court applies that approach as the judge had done in this case. The uh, Court of Appeal approach uh, was, uh, we held, uh, in error because it assumed that once the statutory saving clause was out of the picture, invalidity was necessarily the result. That doesn't follow. Uh, there was no reason why a confiscation order shouldn't be made, should not have been made in an amount that was agreed and in circumstances in which the mistakes that had been made, bad as they were, had had no impact at all on the defendant. Uh, there was no excuse for the prosecution's mishandling of some stages uh, of the procedure, but the remedy for that was orders which had been made that it pay all the costs which had been incurred by anybody as a result. So the result of that is that the confiscation order in the agreed sum is restored and the court draws attention in the judgment to the way in which the statutory rules have become complex uh, as a result uh, of um, uh, not fully recognizing that these days it is usually fairer and better to sentence first and deal with confiscation later. Thank you. The court is now adjourned. <laughs>